Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking with two members of Women for Weapons Trade Transparency, founded in July 2020 by undergraduate students at the University of Texas at Austin. Women for Weapons Trade Transparency is a nonprofit promoting transparency of the weapons and arms trade. Their website is w2t2.org. Rosie Kahn is a founding board member of Women for Weapons Trade Transparency. She's a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin with a quintuple major, something I had not heard of before. She hopes to eventually be a novelist and turn her solar punk vision of the world into reality. I hope we can find out what that means. And Lillian Malden is a founding board member of Women for Weapons Trade Transparency. She's also a graduate of University of Texas Austin. She is a thematic specialist with Amnesty International's USA's Military Security and Police Transfers Coordination Group. I hope we can ask, ask about that as well. Lillian hopes to continue building a career in policy advocacy. Uh, Rosie and Lillian, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thanks for coming on and for what you're doing. Uh, and uh, maybe I can just ask about your organization and the name of it, which says that you want transparency in weapons trade, but I think you actually want transparency for the purpose of reduction or elimination, not just for its own sake. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say that's um, that's accurate. It's a little hard to put all of that in a in a name, but <laughs> I definitely think that is um, an underpinning of our organizational values. Um, and so where did this idea come from? How did it get formed? How do you create an organization as a bunch of undergraduate students that outlasts your being students? Yeah, um, I can kind of, you know, establish the foundation, but um, it started when I was a junior at UT Austin, and um, I kind of just wanted to see if there were some other people that were interested in doing um, some, you know, research and advocacy work just um, a few hours a week. And so kind of put out a call on LinkedIn and said, you know, here's my, here's my idea. If anybody would like to, you know, help me flesh this out, um, you know, here's a, a PowerPoint of kind of the initial organizational structure conceptualization. Um, and so several other people that were in my classes, Rosie included, um, you know, reached out and we started this kind of exploratory journey, just kind of, you know, doing lit reviews together. Um, and it grew into something much larger that has gained, you know, some, some national attention and um, gained members across the country. And so um, it's been pretty unexpected, I think, at least on my end to watch it become what it has. Um, but it's been really um, fulfilling and exciting to see the work that we're able to do and the collaborations we're able to um, to make. So, uh, yeah, Rosie, if you want to go you, into more detail. Uh, but... How did you get involved, Rosie, and how, how has it been growing? How many people in how many places? Yeah, so as Lillian said, I had seen um, her call for interested, like, members on LinkedIn. And so I reached out and said that, you know, I was interested in um, helping set up this idea for an organization. And this was in the summer of 2020. So um, all of us had been sent home from school for an extended spring break, uh, which we never came back from due to COVID. So it was a very uncertain time. We didn't know when we were going to be able to return to normal. Um, and so making use of all the time we're spending at home on our computers to engage with these real world policy issues, which we were learning about in our IRG classes together, IRG being like the international relations and global studies major. Um, and then we have grown to um, have members from different states. We have one person from New York, one person from Illinois, one person from Canada. Um, so it's it's broadened to be more than just something that's rooted at UT Austin. 
It's pretty uh, impressive. Most college uh, organizations uh, are hard to maintain at all because the students come and go and you're maintaining it beyond college. Um, and so what have you been doing? You've been doing research, you've been writing reports and, and articles. Um, can you talk about some of the work you've done? Yeah, so our first um, our first ever project that was very exploratory for us was looking into the UT systems investments. Um, so not just UT Austin, well, that was, is one school that um, this asset manager um, manages. So um, we looked into UTIMCO, which stands for the University of Texas Investment Management Company, um, University of Texas and Texas A&M Investment Management Company. And so, um, we were we were aware kind of vaguely that you know they had an investment portfolio that involved weapons manufacturers such as you know lockheed martin boeing raytheon etc and so we did some kind of investigative research into you know where were these um documents that detailed their investments and um how much were they investing what companies were they investing in and then how were those companies you know complicit in um war crimes and destruction of life um, and warmongering. And so um, that was our, our initial project um, was not, not only finding this information, but then lobbying UTIMCO to divest um, from all their holdings, their debt and equity securities in these companies. Um, and so that was, you know, that began in, in 2020 and is still a, a project that we are working on to this day. You know, our, our research is, is solid. We um, did a lot of lobbying of student government, got them to pass a resolution. We actually spoke with um, some of the UTEMCO board of directors and staff in their office about this. We wrote a detailed report of you know why these investments are so harmful and not even that profitable or beneficial to UTEMCO. Um, and so we kind of went into this knowing it was going to be a very um, you know multi-year long-term effort, and it continues to be as such. Um, and so we're you know we're staying on top of um, you know, finding allies in, um, you know, other universities as well, trying to build, um, you know, inter-university collaboration and solidarity for other divestment campaigns. And so, um, it's been a very long-term, um, effort on our part, but, um, just one of the, the projects that we have, um, released and we have more stuff coming down the pipeline as well. That's that's excellent. And I know that some universities have succeeded and some cities and and a lot of institutions uh, have succeeded at, in divesting uh, from weapons. Uh, just in terms of the report, was the information publicly available or, or easy to get? You didn't have to do any particular uh, make any particular efforts to get the, the numbers on, on what was invested. For us, the data source would have been the Permanent University Fund's detailed schedule of investment reports. So these are PDFs that are published. It's an audit done by Deloitte, I think, and they come out once a year. And because UTIMCO is a public institution serving the UT system um, as like part of the state's um, school system, they um, have all of this information posted publicly, but only for the permanent university fund. So there are other, like a general endowment fund, and there are other parts of Timco's portfolio which are split and named under separate funds that don't have detailed schedule investment reports available. But um, we were able to use the PUF detailed schedule reports and basically search them for the numbers and find um, we'll search them by names. So we just control F, like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Saffron, and so on. Um, yeah. And then put that all together and sort of like do the calculations on getting a total number. Um, and we drew on some like largely uh, familiar sources like SIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, for what is counted as a weapons manufacturer. Um, and we also use their data on like what percentage of the company's revenue comes from arms sales to highlight um, like six top companies, which we um, wanted them to prioritize divestment from because those are companies which are doing sort of the most harm and they're the most high profile weapon manufacturing companies. And the significance of pushing Utimco to divest is 
Um, yes, that it's part of like this long tradition of college organizing to divest from fossil fuels and to divest from weapons. And there's already been a lot of momentum in European financial institutions divesting from weapons or screening them out from their portfolio. But Utenco is um, the nation's largest public endowment fund. Um, the largest one period would be Harvard, but they're a private school system. Um, and so Utenco managing uh, back then, $60 billion worth in their portfolio or in the endowment for this educational system. Um, so getting Utenco to divest from weapons would set a very powerful precedent. It certainly would. Does public, what does it mean to say it's public? Does it mean that the people who will decide to divest are elected? Um, it does not. So the structure of Utimco and um, the sort of power relations and who they respond to is that they are um, basically the fiduciary is the UT system board of regents. And the a and system also has a board of regents, but um, the Utimco basically serves the UT system's board of regents as a fiduciary because the UT system has two thirds stake in the portfolio and the a &M system has one third stake. And so the UT system board of regents are people appointed by the Texas state governor, I believe. Um, and then the UTIMCO board of directors who more closely and directly manage the portfolio and manage their staffing. Um, because we actually found out only when we spoke to them in their office, this info was not on their website, that 98% of UTIMCO's assets are managed externally. So they partner with other asset managers around the world. Um, and that's one of the reasons they gave as to why it's pretty inconvenient and they uh, were not going to implement our asks to divest. And, and perhaps also because they're not elected and uh, you need some means to, to pressure them. Uh, I wonder, did they tell you uh, that they have a legal responsibility to maximize profits? Uh, and well, I was arguing to people who said that uh, a couple of years ago that uh, weapons were not a good investment. Since the escalation of the war in Ukraine, it's very hard to make that argument because the weapons profits have shot through the ceiling. Um, is, is, this a, is this a problem for the campaign? Um, at the time, it was not actually. And knowing that we wanted to speak their language when we had this opportunity to pitch divestment to them, we actually ran the numbers and I calculated what are the five-year returns on these companies annualized and then would compare that to the rate of return on the um, Utenco portfolio as a whole and on the rate of return for the sort of general um, indexes like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones. And we found that those target six big name companies were actually underperforming or average at best. And so that was us speaking their language and showing them that if they were to divest from these companies, they would not be losing profitable investments. And um, in addition, we also gathered data going back um, into the 1990s, which is the earliest that these reports are published. And the investments in companies actually fluctuated over the years for many, several of them going down to zero for several years at a time. So that's also just to say that weapon manufacturers are not a staple of the portfolio and it would not be harmful to the gain that returns on the portfolio to exclude them entirely. I think there are, uh, by the way, we are speaking with Rosie Kahn and Lillian Malden from Women for Weapons Trade Transparency. The website is w2t2.org. Uh, it, it, it seems like the, the work you've done and the expertise you've built up on how to research and how to argue for divestment could be of great value to divestment campaigns around uh, the country and the world. Are you are you offering assistance? Because some of them are going to work and some aren't. In some cases, the, the board members are going to be willing to listen and others they aren't. Are you are you working with with other campaigns? Yeah, we are currently, um, you know, in in talks and collaboration with, um, you know, several other organizers. We have spoken to um, Harvard Fossil Fuel Divest, which you may be aware that that was a successful campaign and that um, Harvard did pledge to divest um, from their investments in, in fossil fuel corporations. Um, and so, you know, their strategy was filing a legal complaint with their attorney general, which, you know, in the state of Texas, we we don't see that as a viable strategy right now necessarily. 
Um, but we are, you know, we've been in touch with um, Code Pink's divestment arm as well. We've spoken to a lot of organizers across the country. Um, and we are actually, you know, on these calls, um, just kind of collecting, um, you know, contact information of people who are interested in getting further involved in this type of work, whether that be, you know, not even just at universities, if, you know, their their city might um, have an investment portfolio or their, their company. So really anybody that's interested in doing divestment work specifically around um, weapons manufacturers, um, we're you know collecting their contact information and building out a Slack workspace, um, which you know I I feel like maybe most listeners might be familiar with Slack, but it's it's basically just um, a a, cha- a big platform with multiple channels that you can um, you know communicate um, with people, kind of like instant messaging um, on a variety of topics. But um, we are you know building that out so that people can have a place to talk about you know, everything going on in the divestment space in kind of a centralized location. And we're also planning to share out, you know, some um, some of our documents that um, were helpful in our planning process, you know, how we did power mapping to figure out who, you know, was the most um, most likely target to maybe, you know, be an ally, um, so, you know, internally, UTIMCO or, or UT system structures, um, you know, also sharing kind of maybe some writing process tips or, you know, how to make arguments, how to, like Rosie said, you know, speak their language. Um, so we are really trying to be a resource um, to other people and, and motivate people to to start their own campaigns because we just, we think this work's really important and that there's a lot of potential for kind of a groundswell of um, this maybe setting a precedent and creating an expectations um, for other institutional investors to, you know, get their, get their investments aligned with um, the people's ethics, so. I think it's wonderful. I couldn't agree more. And and where I work at World Beyond War, we have divestment campaigns all over the place. And I'm going to put you in touch with with Greta Zaro, who works on our divestment campaigns, um, if you haven't been in touch with her already. Um, But I I wanted to ask uh, Rosie and Lillian about another report you did about militarizing police, where it seems there really was a lack of transparency and you found out a a lot about this whole other program that most people haven't even heard of uh, through which the U.S. government has been giving war weapons to U.S. police departments, right? Yep. So the 1122 program is sort of a sibling program to the more well-known 1033 program. Both of them are named after the section which establishes them in the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, which is this, you know, act which is renewed every year. The 1033 program came under renewed, um, like, sort of visibility after the George Floyd protests in 2020 and after Ferguson before that. The 1033 program functions as an excess um, articles grant or transfer program, which means it's sort of like a thrift store for the excess equipment um, or the used equipment that belongs to the military, was in their inventory, and is now being offered to local and state law enforcement agencies um, basically for free. And they only have to pay shipping to um, after they request these uh, equipments and then they will obtain them. The 1033 program has a certain amount of record keeping because it is a transfer or grant program. It's going from some places inventory to another agency's hands. And so there's tracking of this equipment. But in contrast, the 1122 program is not a transfer or grant program. Instead, it's a system that allows enrolled agencies, again, at the local or state level, to use what's called the federal government's purchasing power, essentially getting a discount that the federal government could get through bulk orders um, for new equipment ordered fresh from catalogs. Um, And so the 1122 program is jointly managed by three agencies, the GSA, the General Services Administration, um, the DOD, and the Department of the Army. Um, And so with 1122, because it's not existing used equipment that's in the military's inventories being transferred out, instead it's just equipment that's being bought brand new through this um, catalog, there's very little record keeping on these purchases and what equipment is actually being paid for and which agencies it's going to. 
there's no end use monitoring and there's very little tracking of these what are called controlled items because equipment is split into controlled and uncontrolled uncontrolled is equipment like tables microwaves um, sort of benign items that you can furnish, say, a police station with, um, firefighting equipment, things like that. And then controlled items are things that are more risky, um, would be seen as weapons. And so in the 1122 program, there are some controlled items, but they are not for sale. Um, we have found this document that explains that agencies can request controlled items, but they actually always may, uh, remain the property of the army and they're loaned out and they are expected to be returned afterward to the army. But we were not able to find through multiple FOIA requests and opens records requests and a long drawn out process of appealing FOIAs, we we're not able to find uh, yet how the army enforces that. So this is one example among many of where the 1122 is falling short on sort of being uh, transparent and being good at their record keeping. So I'll turn it over to Lillian to elaborate a bit more. And, and so if a local police department gets some weaponry uh, through this means, where does the money come from? It doesn't come from the army. It comes from the local government, the local police department, right? Right. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so, you know, kind of a main argument for this program in support of it is that, oh, well, you know, we're getting these things at a discount. Um, so it's it's better that we do have this program so that we can have this discount as opposed to, you know, spending more taxpayer money full price. Um, so, it, you know, which I, isn't a good argument because you could just <laughs> get rid of the program and stop spending the money altogether. But um, yes, it is coming from from kind of the, the checkbooks of these local and, and state um, police agencies. Um, but, you know, some of the notable purchases that we, we found in our research, we did uncover about $42 million worth of data that um, we don't, we have not heard anybody else um, say that they've seen. And, you know, all the, the coalition work that we've done and um, the people that we've consulted with and, and gotten some help from dur during this work. But, um, you know, we did find purchases of Bearcats, of SWAT vehicles, um, MRAPs. Um, surveillance gear and lots of training gear for rifles and snipers and, and things of that nature. So the bulk of purchases that we had uncovered through this very like piecemeal um, open records request process, that's not comprehensive because we would have to you know request um, from every municipality in every participating state. Um, but the bulk of it was these, you know, just militarized, like enormous vehicles um, that are, you know, have a track record of being used to especially suppress protesters, um, and being used against people who are protesting um, police violence in the first place a lot of the time. When, when my town, my small city I live in in Virginia got this mine resistant vehicle, they didn't tell anybody. The police didn't tell the city council, didn't tell the public. People spotted it in the garage and said, what the heck is that? Right. And so uh, the problem with getting things through this program that gives them this great discount uh, is that the lo a local group could research all the programs they've heard about to try to find out what weaponry they're you know, democratic government is getting locally uh, and think they've found out everything and not know uh, that their police department has all this weaponry because it came through this program that lacks uh, any transparency, right? Yeah, because there's just, there's no federal mandate to to report um, purchases. And of course, municipalities are very unlikely to publicize this information and just voluntarily say, oh, yes, we we spent um, hundreds of thousands of, you know, your your tax dollars for this giant militarized um, vehicle. So and, you know, the, the open records request process is itself very inaccessible. A lot of the times, um, you know, these agencies will use loopholes to their advantage and, you know, say, oh, well, this was not specific enough or you know, just find ways to kind of avoid that accountability in that process. And so um, it is, it's, you know, it's very frustrating and it's it's scary to think about the, the other things that, you know, we, we weren't able to find in the extra data that is out there. Um, and knowing that there are probably a lot of other um, very harmful articles being transferred through this program. What do, what do either of you recommend to people who are trying to find out 
what the police in their city or county or state might have. Read your report, contact you, or start filing their own Freedom of Information Act requests? Or, or do we need new local laws that require that they reveal what the heck they're doing? Um, I think all of the above could work. Um, definitely, like, when people have questions about this, definitely reach out to us, and we're happy to um, explain more and hop on a call with someone who wants to, you know, like work on transparency in their own locality. Um, the 1122 detailed report, which we have published on our website, is also a good in-depth explanation of the program and how it functions and where um, people can get information and where we know it's sort of a black box because we have, I think, an outstanding FOIA with the Department of the Army to get the data on the control items because we FOIA the other two um, stakeholder sort of agencies that manage 1122, um, but the Army has been not responsive to the FOIA that we filed. Um, but basically there's public databases on the 1033 program so they can start there to look at their state and to look at their city's um, police department. Um, but then honestly filing more open records requests with a specific um, town can be one way to reveal um, if there's any sort of receipts kept um, of, with regard to the 1122 program. And I will say as well that um, the 1033 program does have um, publicly available data. Um, and so, you know, I, I would encourage everybody to look and see um, what their city has purchased or not purchased, but, you know, received via the, the 1033 program. Um, it is, as we, as we currently understand it, much larger in scale than the 1122 program because of the nature of, um, you know, it's, it's free versus um, purchases. So um, that data is available from the federal government, um, from the Defense Logistics Agency. And so um, I believe the ACLU um, Data for Justice Project has that on their, their website. Uh, terrific. We've got just about a minute left. I, I wonder if you could tell people how they can keep in touch, how they can get involved, what someone can do if they want to become uh, active with your organization. Yeah, we have um, several ways you can you can contact us. Um, I think maybe the main way is through email. It's w2t2.org at gmail.com. But we um, also have social media. We have an Instagram. Our handle is w2t2impact. That's uh, the same handle as our Twitter. We also have LinkedIn. It's just our full name, Women for Weapons Straight Transparency. Um, so you can you know, send us an email, send us a message on Instagram or Twitter, um, and we will be more than happy to you know, learn about what you are interested in, um, collaborate with you, and um, work together to you know, advance um, a more just and, and secure and, and equal world with <laughs> fewer weapons. <laughs> Sounds wonderful to me. Uh, we have been speaking with Lillian Malden and Rosie Kahn, who are both founding board members of Women for Weapons Trade Transparency. The website is w2t2.org. Uh, Lillian and Rosie, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, thank you for having us. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.